Hello, welcome along to the Cult TV 96 Highlights Tape. In the next hour and a half, you'll see the finest moments from 73 hours of non-stop entertainment. Starting off, we've got Johnny Goodman. He's talking about his time on The Saint and The Persuaders. Is it harder to get a show off the ground now, because it's all run by lawyers and accountants? Oh yeah, it's very tough to get a show off the ground, apart from anything else. The cost of production has soared so high that um, people are very cautious before they make a show. For those of you that don't know, to give you a rough idea of what it costs, a one-hour um, parochial show, a cop show, being made round the streets of London today on film, a kind of thing like Thief Takers or The Old Sweeney or something like that, you're talking of not less probably starting price of £500,000 an hour. That's half a million pounds for every one show. So when you get into shows like a Star Trek situation, or something where your budget's going to go up to more like seven, seven hundred thousand pounds an hour, you can understand why there's a very great <laughs> debate goes on before anybody actually puts the money down. It is tougher to get shows off the ground, yeah, than in my day. Going, going back to the Persuaders just for a little while, um, you were in charge of production of the Persuaders, and it was you went to the airport to pick. This is a story that I've heard. Uh, you went to the airport to pick Tony Curtis up, and you had a little bit of a yeah, well, problem a picking <laughs> him up. I understand. <laughs> it was a bit of a bit of a nightmare. I mean, those of you who heard the story before, I hate to bore you, but um, uh, you know, I was I was very excited because I I'd been in the business for over 50 years. But I'm like you. I still actually get a big kick out of working with household names and stars, and I was very thrilled about the idea. You know, working with Tony Curtis and. Um, I went down to the airport at the request of Lord Grey, or he was then Sir Lou, I think Sir Lou Grey at that time. And um, when I got down there, um, I, I met Tony as he came off the plane. And uh, I, I, uh, I, you know, I said to him, look, you know, we have a situation, a green, red channel, which do you want to go through? He said, well, you know, what's the problem? I said, well, you know, carrying something like uh, cameras or... I tried to be diplomatic and, um, you know, I got no problem. So he went through the route, we went through the green. And as he stepped over the line, about six customs men fell on him. And uh, they took me away and searched my briefcase and said, did Mr. Curtis try to pass you anything before, you know, he came through? And I said, no, no, not at all. They kept me in an office for about an hour. Um, and um, finally, I got a message to say that Mr. Curtis wanted to see me. He's being charged with <laughs> possession of cannabis resin. And, uh, you know, this is a star that's just arrived in England to make the biggest thing since sliced bread. And I had to go to a small room and see Tony, and um, he was shaken, ashen, actually. And uh, I accompanied him to the police station, and um, uh, there was a whole performance. And unfortunately, he gave my address for some unknown reason. Said he was staying with me, and because um, <laughs> he was trying to cover his embarrassment. And uh, anyway, I got home. I phoned Lord Grade for Lou Grade from a telephone box and said, "We have a small problem, Sir Lou." I said, "Our leading actor's in the Hoosgow right now, and uh, you know we're going to need some um, help on Monday morning." So I got home not knowing that Tony had given my address, and I lived in a very modest. A townhouse in Wembley, and suddenly the world opened up. There was thousands of journalists and cameras and that all knocking on the door saying, we want to see Tony Curtis. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask uh, John was uh, what you feel about, because it, it, my life's made infinitely easier now by the fact that so much of this uh, back catalogue of uh, shows is now on TV, and it's appearing on Bravo, and then lo and behold, BBC think, oh, people are watching it, we'll show it. So how do you feel that, you know, some of this stuff, say 10 years ago, you'd think that was it, it would never be seen again, and now it's on all the time in Britain? Well, I think it's very interesting. I think the fascinating part is that in spite of that, you can't persuade the, the present men with the money that that kind of show could be made again. Um, in other words, they're still sticking to formulas of, you know, sort of very gritty and grotty sometimes, cop shows non-stop. But the kind of adventure stuff of, of Star Trek and uh, the kind of glamour of the persuaders, it's very hard to persuade them to do it. And yet, as you rightly say, it's, uh, it's all been coming backwards and forwards on every channel, you know, the Golden Channel, whatever it's called, and this channel and that channel. Um, of course, from your point of view, it's excellent, because if it generates interest, then your book's going to have even greater interest. So it's self-perpetuating. Well, you know? one thing, uh, certain things had to come out of the book for various reasons, and one line that had to come out which annoyed me was, Charlie's Angels uh, in the 70s. Um, some publicity material says we guarantee within the first X minutes we'll have them in their bikinis. And I think there's a market for this sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> Certainly is for me. But it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm with it's, you. <laughs> it's political correctness, isn't it? I mean, I think with, with Star Trek, fair enough, they're 
they're pushing a, a sort of modern view of life. But there, I there is a market for it. But really, if you say them sort of things, you could get a hit or, or yeah. something yeah. these yeah. days. But the saint a few years ago, there was a lot of trouble trying to get that back on the screens. There was like um, uh, royalties to be paid, and it, it was the Channel Four pulled the plug on it. Do, do you know anything about well, that? Well, I don't. Know. I, I don't. I don't know the background. I do know that I think that um, it's possible that Roger, you know, maybe wanted a bit more than uh, they were prepared to. But at the end of the day, you know, nobody's in this business as a hobby. Um, the television companies don't make them as a hobby, and the television um, uh, transmitting people don't show them as a hobby. And unless they can make a profit, they won't show them. And if an actor demands so much residuals, if he wants so much money uh, for showing something they made 10 years ago that it doesn't become profitable, then it stays on the shelf. But I think they finally came to some arrangements because the mere fact the Saint and the Persuaders and the Champions and all these shows. I did hear, and actually I did hear the other day out of interest, The Baron. Do you remember The Baron show? What did it? Yeah. With The Baron with Steve Forrest. I heard that Steve Forrest actually is asking for so much money and that's the reason why the Baron hasn't been shown again. Oh, that's right, because it, it seems to be about the only one that hasn't that's sort right. of resurfaced. And that's with the lovely Sue Lloyd, who hopefully will be here, this if not today, tomorrow, who yep. I adore and work with on the Baron. But that's the reason you haven't seen the Baron. So, you know, the leading actor is just a bit, I guess, a bit too greedy. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Linda Thorson was saying last year, Dave. Uh, I mean, the, the smallest uh, the person who's got one line in a show of the Avengers, mm. if he refuses to let it be shown, the whole show doesn't get shown. Is that... Well, is that more or less true? Not quite. They, they can certainly say, I'm not going to clear it with equity, and then they've got a problem. But I think in, in a case like that, if, if the guy was number 14 filled and, and walked in a room and said, hi, someone's out, or your taxi's ready, I think uh, equity would just say, show it and we'll sort it. But, yeah. but certainly, I, I think, coming back to what you just said, my understanding was that Roger wanted X number of, of thousands or whatever, yeah. and they basically said it's too high, and Roger said, take it or leave it. And at the end of the day, God bless Roger Moore for saying that, because he did, I mean, he put in a lot of time as the saint. He made it, in my opinion, the show it was. Yeah, you've got great directors, producers, background boys, etc. But Roger was the saint, and always will be the saint, I think, in anyone's eyes. So if he can make a penny or two from the show now, in quote, his old age, God bless him, and he's got a few problems, <laughs> with <Yeah>. Lisa. <laughs> Good luck to him. Thank you, Darwin. Good luck to him. Yeah. 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 Now, actually, can I ask you a question, John? Going back to the persuaders, I think I know the answer, but maybe, maybe some people out there won't, and it's, it's, a, it's a good one, I think. Roger Moore, massive at the time of the persuaders, and, of course, Tony Curtis, huge super Hollywood superstar. Now, you know where I'm coming to, the billing. We never had Roger Moore and Tony Curtis, or Tony Curtis and Roger Moore, we had Curtis Moore. Now, you obviously know all, all this, the background story does. Uh, Why did they resolve it the way they resolved it? I, I don't remember the actual details. You're quite right. There was a bit of a problem. I, I think that t Tony, probably more than Roger, would have been um, pushing for, this, for the, for the so-called premier credit because of his background as a major American movie star. And in the end, they had to settle for what they settled for, and it, it sort of uh, they came to terms. It was a very difficult situation, the Persuaders. I mean, Roger and Tony are, you know, very different people as human beings. They never had a, uh, they never had enormous rapport off the stage. And on the stage, on the film, they, you know, they were the greatest of friends, but it didn't necessarily <laughs> transmit itself to their, uh, their social life. But they, they rubbed along together. Um, the interesting thing is that, that you always think that Tony Curtis is the great ad-libber, the guy that could always come up with a sharp line. Not true. In fact, the truth is that Roger who was a great joker, a great practical joker, did the most diabolical things during the filming that would offend some people to tell you about. Um, he could come up with the ad lib line like that. Tony's the better actor by far, but Tony needs the words on a script page. And even then he doesn't always stick to them. But, but, uh, Tony, but Tony is not the ad-libber. Roger was the ad-libber. Yeah. Uh, and you had the job of um, collecting Mr. Curtis's Ferrari from Italy, I believe, and driving it to the south of France. Is that right? Yeah, it was terrific stuff. Well, what happened was that... Um, but very, very quickly in the background, when we first made the Saint television series, we had to have a car for the Saint to drive. And um, we, I started phoning up all the various companies, you know, Jaguars, Mercedes, um, Jensen's and God. It was unbelievable. They all oh, well, know we can give you a car for a day and stuff like that. I couldn't believe it, because in America, you know, when you ring up Fords or ring up uh, General Motors or something and say, we're making a film, you, c you can't finish the sentence. I mean, the screecher breaks and the guy's dropping the keys in your hand because it costs a fortune to get, um, to get a product on the screen. 
They pay a fortune today, I mean, you can't do it in television, but in movies today, somebody like Hertz will say, fine, if Gregory Peck or whoever it is, or st st uh, Paul Newman can walk into a place when we see the sign Hertz above, here's $100,000, $200,000. Anyway, to the sign at the time of the saint, we had no car and I got turned down by everybody. So finally Roger said one day, look, he said, I'm going to stay in the country, I'm going to live here now. So I'll tell you what, he said, I'll buy this new um, Mark 10 Jag. We won't have an E-Type, it's too difficult to get in and out when you're filming. So I personally rang up Jaguars and said, look, it breaks my heart, we're going to make a TV series and the car will be seen every week on screen if you'd like to sell a Jaguar, Roger's going to buy one. You know what they said to me? They said, Mr. Goodman, they said, we can sell all the cars we make. That we can't give you a priority in delivery. They wouldn't sell me a Jag. So consequently, I was asking around a buddy of mine in the police force that I saw a new thing on the road the other day called a Volvo or something, a sporty car. Cutting it short, Roger went down, loved it. The people were over the moon, supplied the car, supplied a mock-up in the studio, and Volvos took off in this country, I think, because of Roger's driving it on the Saint. And it could have, could have cost billions to get that kind of publicity. By the time we got to the Persuaders, the ball game was quite different. This country had woken up to the value of, of marketing and television, and I made one contact with the PR firm for Aston Martins, went down to the factory, had a lovely time with the directors, had lunch. They agreed to supply a DBS free of charge for the entire series, and a mechanic free of charge to go with us to make sure the car was in prime condition. Then I said, now the problem is we've got to have another car for Cur for, for Curtis, because there's an opening sequence where they race each other along the, the Grand Corniche and stuff like that. And they said, I'll tell you what, they said, we've got very good connections with Ferrari. Few phone calls, next thing you know, I was over in Italy, met with Manicardi, the sales director, got on very well with him, because I'm very fond of Italians. Had an, I used to have an Italian girlfriend before I married my lovely wife. And um, came back to England, and a few weeks later, went out to Italy, and within about two days, I went into the factory, and there was this gleaming... Dino Ferrari in bright red. I have to tell you, it was very sexy. And I got in this car and I drove out the factory and drove it right the way through Italy, over the Grand Corny, stopping every few hours or every hour for a cup of coffee so I could come back and push the crowds away, you know, to get back in the car. <laughs> and with the window down, driving along the, you know, the, the, the Italian Riviera, waving at the ladies. And uh, I drove this car down into, uh, into Cannes and uh, where we filmed for the next few weeks. But that's how the cars came to be on both shows. At the end of the series, um, I could have bought the Ferrari very, very cheap, but by that time Tony had kicked six eight of shit out of it, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I decided a, a three seater, you know, costing about five thousand year insurance was not for the guy like me, so it went back to Italy. Yeah. Dave, uh, according to your book, uh, The Ultimate Avengers, uh, um, the new Avengers had problems with British Leyland, didn't they? Oh yeah, they Brian Clemens is, is forever reciting stories, more or less the same. They, they decided they were going to be totally British, hence the reason red, white and blue, the lion, etc. Everything about the Avengers is red, white and blue. And British Leyland just wouldn't play ball. And then they eventually said, OK, we can supply the cars. And I think the story, the classic Brian Clemens story with this, he went to fetch the car driven by Purdy, which was what, a TR7, was it? And he couldn't get it in reverse. He couldn't get it in reverse, so after 15 or 20 minutes of trying this bloody thing, he gave up, went away, had a meal, came back and said, I'm going to crack this up, I'll do this bugger if it kills me, and drove it X number of uh, yards forward and tried reverse, and it wouldn't go into reverse. And at the end of the day, I think, on the gear knob, they'd got, they'd got a bloody Capri uh, gear movement or something, you know. It was typical. And he... Oh, the other thing was they went along to the, the road show to promote the new Avengers and to promote the cars, of course. Uh, they arrived, uh, this, this is Pat McNee, Joanna Lumley, Gareth Hunt, Brian Clements, and I think Albert, Albert Fennell. And they arrived there, they were greeted by them. There was no one to greet them. They went to the BL, the BL stand. It was closed. They found someone who said, well, the BL stand, you know, where, where is everyone? Oh, they've gone to lunch. They've gone to have a drinkies. Oh, really? And of course, all this was arranged. And that's, that's just about typical of, I mean, this was what, 70, 72, 70, sorry, 76, 78, so that's about typical of what Johnny said. After that, I th they probably bucked their ideas up, but, but prior to that, dealing with the English was terrible. No question of that, yeah. Anyway, it's wonderful to be here. And, um, and maybe after this weekend, there will be that many more Dark Shadows fans. So, I mean, you were saying to me before we started that um, this was actually your first job 
out of college, wasn't it? Yes, so and I, uh, I'm, I'm from um, a place in the United States called Minnesota. It's a little farm area in the, in the middle of the country. And I went to New York to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and my very first job out of school was Dark Shadows. It was the very first job of a lot of other actors as well, David Selby and uh, Laura Parker, Kate Jackson, do you remember her from... Uh, Angels? Charlie's, Charlie's Angels. Charlie's Angels? Oh, yes. Another cult TV show. Um, so it was my first job. I spoke the very first lines on the very first day, and that was 30 years ago, June 27th, 1966. Didn't I just give my age day. away? I did, didn't I? Um, uh, well... <laughs> I know what I was going to They're using their toes there. Yes, she, she left college <laughs> at the age of three, yes. Uh, um, it, it must have been. A, uh, was it very daunting? Because it, it must. It, it was. A, it was. Um, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but w it was a live show. Wasn't oh, it, it was live. That was. Uh, oh, that was before we had uh, all of the uh, benefits of tape and and so on. We used to do this on kinescope. And in fact, we worked a week and a half in advance and sometimes ran up until the last minute. But believe it or not, these kinescopes had to be mailed across country to all of the little stations for ABC all across the country. And it was daunting also because, as I say, it was my first job out of school. And I was working with people like Joan Bennett, who is a legendary film star. First time that she had ever worked in television. And it was just an extraordinary experience. And there were several other really well-known American actors. So, yes, it was daunting. But not only did you play the one role, mm -hmm. you played three others. Yes. <laughs> so, four roles in one TV show. I played, uh, I played a fast-talking um, roadside diner uh, waitress and, uh, who had an alcoholic father, and she was sort of, you know, tough from the wrong side of the tracks. And uh, then not long into the show, I suddenly became the governess and I was up in the big house. I don't know where I got the education or, or anything else that happened along the way, but I was then the governess. But the other three roles were Lady Kitty Hampshire, who was a, a woman from, uh, from England who married into the family. And then there was Rachel Drummond, who was a governess in the 1800s. Lady Kitty, I think, was in the 1700s. And then I played Josette Dupre, probably my favorite role. And she, was, she became the, the uh, fiancé of the vampire. And then I worked with Jonathan Frid, got bitten on the neck, thank you very much, and uh, became a vampire in my own right. Now, uh, these days, uh, vampires in the movies are being portrayed as very erotic and sexy and <laughs> all that. I mean, in the, in the 1960s on American TV, that, w that must have been... Um, a little bit of a dodgy area to get into? I maybe? did say he only bit in the neck. Ah. Yes, we got away with a lot. Oh, right. We got away with a lot, and, and it was really fun to do because nobody, I don't think, quite understood what we were doing at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. But we had a lot of college professors and doctors and, and uh, all sorts of people tuning into the show to, to see what we were up to. My other feeling is that there were people like George Lucas and, and uh, Coppola and uh, uh, probably Marty Scorsese. In fact, that's almost definite because I auditioned for him when I was only 18. So they were all watching Dark Shadows. This was the first live television show that, had, uh, that made use of um, all sorts of special effects, promo key, and we had bats flapping around and, and so on. So I, I think that uh, a lot of them got their first taste of, of all of that sort of thing. I mean, it was bizarre for afternoon entertainment. Now, when you say that a program makes 1,225 episodes, <laughs> yes. you, you immediately think, well, goodness me, that must have been a hellish amount of work. Well, because it was live, we had a lot to learn every night. And because we had a lot of special effects, very often they would skip the rehearsal, and they would say, uh, just, what was the expression? Um, Actors were going, were going to the, the um, what was that expression? Uh, we're going to the next giggle, which just meant we were, we were going to the next thing that required props. So very often we were never rehearsing our lines. And, um, and we started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we had a show that was, uh, went out live at 4 in the afternoon, and then we started rehearsing the next day's show. So it was daunting. We did 1,225 episodes in um, a three-and-a-half-year span. And those shows had a lot of mistakes in them. We called them bloopers. And uh, we had 
Well, there was one time as Lady Kitty Hampshire, I was wandering through a graveyard wearing a long velvet cape, and I knocked over one of the heavy tombstones, which of course was made out of styrofoam, and dragged it with me in my wake. And there, were, there was another time down in the mausoleum when Jonathan Frid as the, as the vampire was swatting at a, at a fly that was dive-bombing his nose. So there were all sorts of things like that happening, like uh, things falling over, dead bodies moving. And we used to beg our, our producer and creator, Dan Curtis, to please let us do it again, but there's nothing he could do. I mean, even on the, on the Kinney. So we, um, all of these episodes are now available on home video. And there is one video called The Bloopers. Oh, it's one right. of the best-selling ones. Everybody <laughs> loves it. <laughs> this is the thing with uh, um, series like Star Trek, for instance. Yes. They, they, they're really reticent to allow blooper reels to actually go out. Oh, no, no, no. That show is... That's a totally different thing. First of all, it, uh, it's a... Working on Star Trek is one of the most exciting things in the world. You, I had makeup calls at... Uh, um, oh... 3.30, quarter to four in the morning. Um, I was green in mine. Uh, I had ears and a prosthetic piece. And only if you're a principal, if you're a guest star, you get fresh ones every day. And if you're an extra, you, <laughs> you, you use <laughs> the same ones. So at the end of this shoot, I had all of these wonderful things that, um, what's his name, Mike Westmore, terrific makeup artist. Uh, somebody that I'd worked with once before. I had a whole bunch of these, and of course I had just finished doing the show right before Halloween, which is a big holiday in the States, and I was, I was much in demand by the children of, of various friends. It was a handing them out for trick-and-treating. Yes, he said, that was very good, very good. He said, would you like to come along to North Acton rehearsal rooms and meet John Pertwee? And I thought, well, they're a bit thorough, aren't they? Because this doesn't normally happen. So I said, yes, I'd be delighted. And he said, I will get another actor in, and instead of me reading the scene with you, he will. So I thought, yes, yes, fine. So we went to North Acton. Another actor was there who actually turned out to be Stephen Thorne, who eventually played the baddie in the last radio, The Ghosts of End Space, that John and I did. So strange how circles come around. Anyway, I did the scene with Stephen, and Barry seemed pleased. He said, John's on his way down. Um, my first look at John, he came through these doors, and he's a very tall, was a very tall gentleman. This shock of white hair. He had a denim jacket on. He was covered in badges, and he had a girl on either arm. <laughs> now, I'm not for one moment putting the wrong image of John Ford, but actually, you know, even very well-known actors can be shy. And it was the PA and the AA. AFM and he said please come down with me I've got to meet this new girl so they were hanging on to either arm and as the story goes and I don't really remember it terribly well as John stood in front of me to chat to me Barry went behind me and went like that meaning if you like the look of her she read very well so then as the story goes Barry came in front and chatted John went behind and said well if you think she's good she looks okay <laughs> fine <laughs> and the reason for this is and I'm not telling tales out of school they had actually chosen another girl um, who never actually depicted, they'd started to rehearse, and not because in any way she wasn't any good, but when you have two people, one the lead and one the second lead, you have to have a match. It has to look physically right. Um, it doesn't matter, it, it doesn't mean good, bad or indifferent, you just have to gel, and it's very important. John's doctor was the kind of doctor who he would put his cloak around the little chick. Do you, do you know? He was very much the gentleman doctor. And the girl that they'd actually chosen was much bigger than I am. And it just didn't physically match. It didn't work with her running away because it looked as though she could have actually bopped the monsters. <laughs> and, you know, you, it's a very simple story, very simple format, Doctor Who. And, you know, you've got to get it right, otherwise it doesn't work. So that was, um, that was the story I heard afterwards. And they were really going spare trying to find someone because time was getting on. That was to my advantage. Um, and Barry offered me the job on the spot. And I said, yes, I would love to. So I went home so pleased with myself. I phoned my agent, and there was this pause, and he said, you didn't accept, did you? I said, well, yes, I did. He said, well, God, he said, couldn't you have let me talk money first? <laughs> so that's why I wasn't on such a good contract, I think. I don't know. But I was very pleased to, um, to be offered the job. Now, obviously, um, it, it's been a, a very sad year for Doctor Who fans with the loss of John yes. Pertwee. Um, if, if there was one particular memory that stood out of John, uh, about John, what would it be? John will be very much missed. Um, 
he died very suddenly, but John had a wonderful life, and he would have hated to have actually grown old in a way that all that entails. He was a very physical man. He always, he water skied, he scuba dived, he did everything. And he, he would hate to have been any less, you know, than he was. And he did have a wonderful life. The thing I most remember about John, besides the funny times, um, the thing that stands out most is his immense questioning of everything. He, this amazing appetite for knowledge for wanting to know everything. You know, when you're working on something, you meet different actors, and they would say, oh, I went and did um, this the other day and, and polished some gems. John was so interested, but he would always say, oh, yes, I've done that. And after a while, I think, John, you can't have done all this. He had. He'd done, it. there's nothing I ever, there's no actor I ever met who said they'd done something that John actually hadn't been there and, and done it as well. It was his appetite for living. He used to leave me standing. I would get tired. I would be tired. I would want to go home after a production. John would always say, well, let's, um, Let's just um, just chat about this, that, and that. His, 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 just his, his appetite for living was immense. And he was not only, he had a great career as an actor, I was a very small part of his career, and I'm very honored to have been part. You know, sometimes you would forget all that John had done before Doctor Who. And he would bring all that baggage on with him. He was not just an actor, he was a personality. And that is, that is what Tom was as well, good actor though he is. He, he has that personality, and I think, to be a very good doctor, you have to have that. It's that bit extra that um, you bring on that, that extra baggage with you, which counts. When Tom actually got the role, um, was it a very difficult transition time or, <laughs> or, or not? I didn't know anything about Tom. I mean, I knew jo when I joined, I knew John was going to leave. I was told that from the beginning. Um, John wouldn't mind me telling you the story because he would tell it against himself. himself. He thought that he was doing rather well in the role of Doctor Who, as he was. And he thought, well, I'll go up to the powers that be and I'll ask for a rise. So he, he went up to the powers that be. This was before I joined, at the end of Katie's season. He said, actually, old chaps, he said, I, I, I think, um, you know, a rise would be rather nice. And they just said no. And he said, they didn't say, well, we'll think about it, or, well, we'll get back to you. He said, they just said no. He said, I was sort of left there, you know, on my dignity. So I said, well, I'm going then. And I think John rather regretted that afterwards. In fact, I know he did. But anyway, that's what he decided, and he stuck to it. And when we were filming our last episode of Planet of the Spiders, our last story together, I noticed John starting to distance himself in the rehearsal room. He did something he'd never done before. He brought in his fan mail to answer in, in rehearsal when he wasn't rehearsing. And he chose a table right at the other end of the rehearsal room and a chair and he laid all his things out, and when he wasn't working, instead of just chatting and watching and doing, he would remove himself physically, and he'd go and he'd do that, and he was trying to, that's how it worked for him. And of course, Barry Letts would be coming in, talking to me, saying, right now, um, we're thinking, and names were mentioned, um, who'd been asked to do Doctor Who. Um, Jim Dale was one of them. Um, Ron Moody, who turned it down, who I met afterwards, and he was very sorry he turned it down. Um, Graham... Horden, and who did Cat Weasel? Who did Cat Weasel? Great, Bailden, Geoffrey Bailden. And I think he turned it down as well. Anyway, Barry came in one day very excited and he said, we've got Tom Baker, isn't that wonderful? And I, for my sins, I didn't, you know, know anything about Tom Baker. But I'm so glad he got it, I really am. Um, and we had to do, um, what, 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 what do you call the scene where one doctor turns into the other? Regeneration. Thank you very much. This, you're talking to the person who didn't even know what TARDIS meant till I left. John used to go mad. <laughs> Time and relative dimension in space, Liz. Oh, yes, John, yes. I wasn't interested. I really wasn't. Because Sarah didn't have to be interested in that, you see. Um, so t the first time I met Tom was in the studio, last episode of Spiders. He had already started rehearsing Robot with Ian Martyr down south. And um, he came into the studio. Now, that particular day, John did have a bad back. John had trouble with his back quite a lot. But you know, it really, it was playing up and you wonder, well, was it playing up because he was leaving? There was a lot of unsaid things going on. S me and Sarah, I had to be very upset because I thought the doctor was dying. This is the first time I'd seen him die. So A, I had on board that Sarah was upset because she thought the doctor was dying and B, because John actually was leaving and we did. We were friends, we got on very well together. And as I say then, Tom was an unknown quantity to me. And Tom had his own agenda. You know, he had to find his doctor after John's very popular doctor. 
So there was all that going on. And um, it, was, it was basically an introduction, hello, very polite, how do you do? John got up out of the way, Tom lay down, did it, Tom got up, nodded, walked away, uh, you know, and everyone just got on. And that night I had to go down, um, I forget where we were filming Robot. I finished in the studio at 10 and I was taken by car down the next morning to film with Tom to do some, and then come back to do some studio with John. So it was very fragmented. And I noticed Ian and John getting on so well together and I thought, oh, oh, is the room for me in this relationship? But it wasn't the time to really push it. You know, you had to wait to your turn and I thought it's, it's important. So let it just, let's just wait and see if it, um, if it gels, if it happens. And it did, it was wonderful. Favourite episode? Uh, well, obviously as an actor, um, Liz likes the, the talking, what I call the talking heads bit. Um, but I liked all the falling around and jumping around. I can't remember what it was called, but we had a lot of people with um, funny heads on. Um, there were not funny heads except us. No, they were over their real funny heads. And um, I think it was Captain, it was amazing. Captain Yates was driving a car. Um, and so I doubled Captain Yates to drive the car. Um, and then the car knocked somebody over the cliff. Uh, and when you pull the face off, there's just this egg. I don't know what it was called. I know there was questions asked in the house because I was dressed as a policeman and suddenly became a villain and they were quite upset by it. Um, and I had the chance to do a, quite a nice bounce down this cliff, which uh, I was quite pleased with because um, for every bruise you get, you just get a, a 50 pound note, cover it with germline and hold it over the bruise. <laughs> makes it much better. I used to like the jumping about. I, I fell about laughing with the, the sea devils. I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Um, purely and simply because I know what the dialogue was. Uh, you saw these menacing creatures appearing out of the sea and I've got six big husky stunt blokes and they're all going, fucking hell, I'm falling over. Oh, my now. Here, give us a hand here. Do you, do, you, <laughs> do you remember when you were in Exelon? And you had to walk up the sand dune, and you all kept walking on your skirts as you got up. Yes, <laughs> the same. Yeah, walk up the inside of your frock. <laughs> we all look like the seven dwarfs when we got to the top. <laughs> I mean, all those things—they're so funny. I mean, when we—the first time we ever took the Daleks outdoors, they put down big tracking boards for them, and you'd see these Daleks going, eh, 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 "Oh, bloody hell!" <laughs> This thing with little legs out of the bottom, <laughs> waving helplessly. They couldn't turn corners. And things like that. No, they couldn't. They couldn't they see. They built a lick along on along the rail. Yeah. But they couldn't. Once they turned, they would. And it was so funny. I mean, <laughs> unbelievably funny. I mean, just I, I fell about laughing so much. It was it was such good fun. Fine day. I saw a poster on a hoarding, somewhere in Bloomsbury, which said next Thursday public performances by graduating students of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. 2 p.m. admission free. That was the grabber. <laughs> so because by this time I'd become fairly skilled at my deliveries so that I very often was able to scrounge a couple of hours to do something pleasurable when I'd finished my deliveries long earlier than my employers thought was possible. So I thought I'll go along there because I'd, although I'd never seen a play, never even read a play, I did know about this Royal Academy of Dramatic Art because just at that time, the great actor Charles Lawton, he of Mutiny on the Bounty and Les Miserables and all those great performances, had just had a great deal of publicity because he'd just won an Academy Award. And I read somewhere in a newspaper, I suppose, that he'd been trained on a scholarship at this Royal Academy of Dramatic Art place. So I thought, if I go along there, I'll be seeing a whole lot of budding Charles Lawtons. So along I went, next Thursday, 2 p.m., admission free. <laughs> and expecting all these wonders to break over me, with all that shy, bashful modesty which characterizes Cockney youths of 15, I thought they were terrible. I said to myself, Carl Stroop, I'm going to do better than that without getting off my bike, or something like that. <laughs> You'll perceive that in those days, <coughs> I had a Cockney action, accent that you couldn't cut with a knife. So, smitten by some extraordinary, arrogant impertinence, 
I wrote off to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And I said, I don't know, I wish I had a copy of the letter, but in my, what I thought was my most elegant, sophisticated style, I wrote to them, I said something like, um, look here, what about this year's scholarship to which of what you give out? I would like to have it, or something like that. You see. <laughs> well, they were very gracious and they wrote back in due time. And they said, well, yes, we do have a scholarship, but it has to be competed for. And you must be prepared to find that there are perhaps two or three hundred other young people who would also like to have it. However, if you'd like to compete, here are some pieces which you must present for your audition. Shakespeare, Greek drama, never heard of any of them. Have to choose two of those. So I thought, well, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'll pick a couple of them. But then they said, you must also present something of your own choice. Well, I'd I, I never seen a play, I'd never even read a play. But I thought some gutter cunning got into me, which suggested to me that I ought to do something in my own native tongue, as it were. And so I, uh, as a youngster, had kicked about a good deal in the street markets in the East End of London, and I'd heard a lot of the marvellous market patter, sales patter, which a lot of these market characters would use. And so I put together a sort of montage. Uh, I didn't know the word then, of course, but that's what it was. A sort of montage of, of market cries of the East London, which I was able to do in my own native accent. And um, one of them, I fancy I can remember to this very day, it was some patter that was used by an old guy who was trying to sell uh, a, a curious green oleaginous substance, which he called the ungent. Uh, which came in little round tins and which he led you to believe uh, no matter whether you rubbed it on you or shoved it in you would cure whatever was up with you. Uh, it, it, it was a kind of cure-all, you see. And of course, like so many people who sell cure-alls, uh, he was of desperately sickly appearance. <laughs> and he used to stand at the curb. Is it all right if I stand up? Yes. Uh, can you manage? Yes, pan up a bit. Yes, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't stand up too quickly, the cameraman always says. You do that, they go, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this old geezer uh, uh, used to do as his sales patter, this dialogue, and he would stand at the curb with these tins of the ungent ranged in front of him there, uh, in a decaying raincoat and a battered flat cap and looking far from well, and he would harangue the passers-by somewhat like this. He would go... <laughs> Do you have them horrible shooting pains from hip to thigh? <laughs> a coating on your tongue that cannot be removed with knife, fork or spoon? <laughs> An offensive sediment in your chamber utensil? <laughs> a fluttering sensation in your stomach as of two birds mating in a paper bag? <laughs> With it, what you want is the ungent. <laughs> Believe it or not, on the stage of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, as one of my audition pieces, I did that. <laughs> well, to, to make a long story, as they say, even longer, <laughs> uh, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art indeed gi did give me their scholarship. It's quite extraordinary, because the scholarship carried with it not only complete tuition fees for the two-year course, but also provided a maintenance grant in other words, it was assumed that the winner of the scholarship might come from somewhere outside London and would have to support themselves while they were in London. So I got a maintenance grant of three pounds a week. Huge riches in the early 1930s. More than my father had ever earned. And he was out of work at the time. <laughs> uh, so there I was, off and running. And it shows you what surrounding influences can do for you. Because, of course, when I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, I became introduced for the first time to girls from a totally different world than I came from. They were mostly gently bred and expensively educated young women who, um, who looked sweet and smelled lovely. And I was in, in love with a fresh girl five times a day, of course. And inevitably, without my realizing it, my accent started to become absorbed by osmosis into theirs. And I began gradually to speak the way they did. Until finally, it was rather comical 
when my, my mum and dad started to notice as I went my daily journey from Shoreditch to Bloomsbury and back again. They had neither of them ever set foot in Bloomsbury, no idea what it was like. They began to notice that I was talking, I think my dad expressed it once as a bit posh, <laughs> which of course raised considerable alarm and despondency among my childhood friends all around in Shoreditch. But they bore with me <laughs> and eventually I got through my course at the Royal Academy and went out into the big wicked world to set myself to earn my living pulling faces and making noises. And here's the difference. In those days, I was telling somebody just a little earlier, when Sydney and I were first married in 1938, I bought a little penny cash book from Woolworths in which I wanted to keep a note of what we earned and how we spent it. And we were two young beginning actors and every single week in that little cash book there is a credit balance of the amount of money that we were able to save to put into our post office savings bank account of an average of two pounds, sometimes two pounds ten, two pounds fifty a week. Now, such a thing when I recite it to people, I promise to leave this little cash book to the Victoria and Albert Museum because no one will believe it otherwise. Such a thing in today's world is totally unthinkable because our profession has become so grotesquely overcrowded, not only here in the UK, but in all the other English-speaking countries that I know of. I'm a member of no, yet, no less than 14 professional associations around the world. And so I'm pretty well in touch with the way things are both in the UK and in the US and in Canada and in Australia and New Zealand and so on. And a statistical survey was held recently to try and assess what the economic condition of people seeking to work as performers is in today's world. And it showed, and the figures were very little different in any of the English-speaking countries, it showed that of all the young people never mind young people, people of any age, seeking to work as performers, that is to say actors, singers, dancers, of the whole cargo of them throughout the English-speaking world, more than 75% have earnings below the poverty line. Now, if you're not holding your breath, let it go and then take it in again, because I'll repeat that. More than 75% of all people of whatever age, attempting to earn their living as performers in today's world, have earnings below the poverty line. That means that our profession has changed to such a degree that it is no longer a prospect from which anybody can be at all sure of earning anything like a living for a lifetime. So for any of you, for all of you, who may ever have cherished thoughts of coming into the face-pulling trade, I can only say to you, unless you have rich parents, a rich lover, or a rich husband or wife, don't go near it. It's all very well for me. When you get to my advanced age, if you can say the words in the right order and not fall over the furniture, you're quite a rarity, you see. And so I've at long last, are we running out of time, Susan? No. no. no? Are we running out of patience? That's the next thing. No. Start and stamp. <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, I was just saying that we be one becomes, naturally, because of my age and the range and volume of my experience, uh, one, one does become quite a, a rarity. Uh, and that means, of course, that we now have, Sydney and I, thank God, uh, Sydney uh, was an actress throughout our lives, but of course she's been an invalid for these last ten and more years, and so she's not really been physically able to work as an actress, but we both of us worked all over the world, and um, we have achieved that greatest of all luxuries for an actor and actress. What is it, I hear you cry? Well, it ain't five Rolls, Rolls Royces, and it ain't six wives. It is freedom of choice.
the fact that I'm able, out of a clear blue sky, to, very much at the 11th hour, uh, the fact that I'm able to come and spend 24 hours with you is the luxury of the freedom of choice. And I must just tell you, lastly, before I invite your questions, uh, a little adventure that befell me not very long ago. As I was saying, I haven't, I've chosen not to work for the last few months because my wife has been really rather seriously ill, and uh, so I've been ducking things. But uh, not very long ago, uh, my agent in uh, L.A. sent me a script on behalf of a producer, a Hollywood producer, who shall be nameless to protect the guilty. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was appalling. It was really terrible. And so I said to my agent, well, will you please tell Mr. So-and-so, thanks, but no thanks. Well, apparently the message was delivered to Mr. So-and-so, and he somehow or other got hold of my phone number in London. And he called me up, personally. And he said, um, I understand you're kind of a bit reluctant about doing this thing in our picture. And I said, well, that would be one way of putting it, yes. <laughs> uh, he said, at once, the Hollywood answer, his poor apology for a mind, translated this negative into terms of a demand for more money. So without any kind of pause in the conversation, he said, well, now, listen, about the price, I mean, don't let your agent just let you believe that it's the last word, because, I mean, we could go too. And he started to name sums of money more than double uh, the price that had originally been quoted, until I finally had to say to him, my dear young friend, you forced me to the desperate extremity of speaking the truth, the whole truth, to you. I would not be seen dead in the kind of mindless twaddle that you're involved in producing. <laughs> <laughs> you've been here for what now? How long have you been? When did you arrive? You arrived. Uh, nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. And no one has introduced us. So, hi. Hello, how are you? Mal no Bondi. one has told me who you are, what you do. I presume you're the Kung Fu man, are you? <laughs> are you? <laughs> well, um, I've been called a lot of things, actually. I'm, unlike Terry, uh, Terry is a stuntman, I'm an action actor. I can act a bit and I can throw myself about a bit. Hang on, that's throw me. An action actor. Yes. Oh, well, that's... John, John, you've you got to tell them... Is this... You, you might have done it down, down there, but tell them about when you did the uh, movie in Hong Kong, where... Well, tell them. Tell them. Well, I made a mistake of trying got... to... Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. John Carrigan. I think some people have seen me before. I'm not advertising, but I'm about to star in a, a new series called Legion. Fine, thank you. <laughs> I had to get the plug in. It could be, could be, if you come and sit up here it is. Um, yes, I went to Hong Kong to do a martial arts movie. I played the second lead in this film. Not just a stuntman, I played the second lead in the, the whole film. The third day I was there, the director said to me, in this fight scene you're in the office, there's two Chinese stuntmen. You have a 34 beat master shot. So you keep going, you have a fight scene, <laughs> we worked it out, 34 beats, you don't stop, master shot. So. On the 35th beat, this door would burst open, this massive Chinese guy would come in. I would do what you call a hook kick to his head. He would turn around to a spin kick, hit me in the chest. I would go out through the first floor window, down, and that would be me out for a while. Okay? I said, okay, yeah, fine. We spoke about this. He said, I'll do the master shot first. Uh. So we choreographed this fight scene, punches and kicks, and I'm getting the better of these two Chinese wonderful stuntmen. In China, they're, they're mad though. Everything is real. They pull nothing. Okay, not, you know, I mean, over here, if they don't like you, they don't, they don't always pull it. But over there, it's crazy. So I did this master shot. And I'm kicking and punching and thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to get launched here. This is going to make me my uh, stardom. On the 34th beat, I hit this Chinese guy and he's down. The door bursts open. There he is, King Kong. Wow. He's about 18 stone. Um, so I did, as I was told, threw a kick to his head, which he shrugs off. Then I froze waiting for him to fake this spin kick, and I thought that would call cut. We'll prepare um, a stunt glass window, maybe a wire pull, get a nice air bed, go backwards through the window, you know, as you do, as we would do over here. No, as I froze on this whack, it was, oh, because he spun, hit me full pelt in the chest, 
which lifted me up out the real glass window down the first floor, 12 cardboard boxes, there may have been 13, I might be lying, but 12 cardboard boxes, to break my fall. And a camera there to catch my exit. So um, that was my, <laughs> my third day in Hong Kong. I'm laying on my back going, the director comes up, says, oh, come back into our good print. I, and that was it. So if Terry had been choreographing this, it would have been slightly different, but I'll never go back to Hong Kong to do that martial arts film. I survived, but only just. So that's the story, Steve, yeah. Just to uh, update you, at uh, four o'clock, I uh, rang with the old mobile phone and spoke to Kate, Jerry Anderson's publisher, and said, um, how you doing? Where are you? She said, oh, well, we're nine miles from Norwich. Oh, I thought, goodness me. However, when you've got uh, an incredibly fast car and an incredibly fast driver, you can guarantee that Jerry Anderson is now here. So, ladies and gentlemen, please can you show your appreciation for the man himself, Jerry Anderson. Right, and we have here, and we'll see if we can get a camera close up, we have Jerry Anderson, the authorised biography. Now Jerry, this has been a long time in production. Um, I certainly remember it being spoken about, oh, back in 92, I think. Um, and of course it was it started off by a gentleman called Simon Archer, and uh, unfortunately um, he died. Um, in, a, in a tragic accident. Um, did that steal you to actually carry on and make sure that this got published? Well, w first of all, if I can tell you something about Simon. Um, Simon was uh, a PR man at Kodak. Um, he did the PR for Dave Lee Travis. He was about uh, 30 and he was a very, very nice person. Um, he interviewed me, uh, oh, I, you know, probably a hundred hours of tape, and produced uh, the first draft of this book. Um, having, having produced the first draft, he came to me with a proposal. He said, look, if I pick out some interesting facts from all these interviews, I reckon I could make a book called Fab Facts. And I agreed to this, and in fact he produced this. And he received a call from the publisher to say that the, the first print, you know, the first printed copies were ready. And uh, would he like to go up to collect them? And he was driving along the M25 to collect the book when he was killed in a motor accident. Um, I think the sad thing is that ITC of America, who at that time owned the rights to Thunderbirds, um, had a dispute over the royalty. And uh, they couldn't bring themselves to make an exception and allow the book to go through. They actually stopped the publication. And I frankly think that was unforgivable. This book, uh, the biography, was then put on ice because none of us felt like continuing. And then two years later, Stan Nichols um, took over, updated it, merged his, uh, his style with Simon's, and is now being sold. And it's, you know, it's apart from my story, it's, it's a memorial to Simon. Now, I actually, I, well, what, there's something I actually want to do. Uh, just uh, as a little surprise, because um, tonight, uh, I, know, I know you've got to get away, but tonight we have our Cult TV Awards, which are voted for by the people here. And they're five high, highest uh, nominated shows, were the shows for the best children's series were Delta Wave, The Herbs, Tiswas, The Original Tomorrow People, 
and Thunderbirds. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the award for best children's series at Cult TV 96 is Thunderbirds. And I'd like to present you with an award. And here we have, here's Sarah with the certificate. Thank you. And a very hastily cobbled together award. It's a little bit wobbly, unfortunately. But uh, I think that's just a token of, to show our appreciation for that particular series. Um, and when the award is finished, we'll actually sort of uh, get it sorted for you. Well, I mean, this is a great surprise, and thank you very much. We're, we're just completing a new house that we're building for ourselves. And we've got some of these doors with lots of panes of glass. You know the ones that, it's yeah. about this size. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorted. Sorted. <laughs> no, but seriously, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, 1996 is a, a bit of a... Um, a milestone year for you. It's 50 years since you actually got into the business and 40 years since the first series of Adventures of Twizzle. Um, out of all the things that you've done, which one particular incident stands, stands out as sort of that's the memory that you, you most treasure fr from all your TV work? Oh boy, that's, uh, <coughs> that's a fast one, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, perhaps I would say one thing before we go any further. This business of being in the business 50 years, I mean, it's a bit misleading. I directed my first picture when I was five years old. So, you know, don't, I'm not as old as you think I am. <laughs> um, I, I, I suppose, really, uh, it's odd because, I mean, here you are, I've just been given an award, but when we made Thunderbirds, uh, we won the um, uh, silver medal from the Royal Television Society, um, and that uh, meant that we could have a dinner at the Guild Hall, and we were also invited to Buckingham Palace to um, a tea party, you know, with the Queen. And uh, I suppose, you know, that, that award uh, really probably was, was the highlight because it, it, it really is, it's probably the most major award in the country. It's funny you should ask that question just after getting a, a new award. It all ties together nicely. Now, I know, I know you're a man who really, you're, 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 a, you're a man of the now and of the present and of the future um, in, in, uh, in actual television production. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your new project? Yes, um, I'm producing a new show which is called Lavender Castle. Um, it's uh, a 10 minute program. It's designed for children around the age of nine. And it's designed by Rodney Matthews. Um, Rod Rodney is a, quite a famous artist uh, in science fiction terms and uh, he's done many many calendars and books and record covers and he has created some wonderful characters in his inimitable bizarre style uh, it's being made again with puppets but you know don't let this fool you the, these are sort of year 2000 puppets uh, we're filming at Cosgrove Hall where they specialize in this stop-motion type of work. Uh, we're um, building a lot of the hardware models on computers, uh, creating a lot of the background on computers and a lot of the animation on computers. So it'll be, um, you know, using all um, the modern technology that's available. And the story is very simple. It's about um, a bunch of uh, bizarre characters who are traveling through the universe looking for Lavender Castle. Now, Lavender Castle 
is the sort of place we could really do with now. You know, it's a place where there are no punch-ups, nobody, nobody knifes each other, um, everybody's happy. Uh, I suppose really it's uh, what we would call heaven. But, but we're calling it Lavender Castle so that uh, kiddies uh, in all the countries in the world, um, all skin colours, all nationalities, all religions, can uh, you know, create their own particular version of heaven uh, in Lavender Castle. Now we're in pre-production. We start shooting next year. We're doing 26 initially out of 100 episodes, so we're going to be quite busy. That's terrific. Now, I have to say my all-time favourite show is UFO. And I was so glad that it's back on, on the BBC. And actually, it's, that's going to be the... I think this is the first time it's actually been networked ever in its, in its uh, um, lifetime. Now, I know you've said in, in various interviews that there were difficult actors which didn't help the transition from sort of the, the puppet series to the live action. Can we have a scoop? Who were the difficult people on UFO? There's no problem in answering this question. Um, my reference to difficult actors um, really didn't apply much to, to UFO. I mean, I mean, let's just talk about UFO. Um, Ed Bishop was absolutely a perfect guy to work with. I mean, he, he knew his lines, he was always on time. Um, there was nothing difficult about him, and uh, he, I, I can only say that you, you really couldn't find a nicer guy and a more competent person to work with. It would be very unfair of me to mention names, but there were one or two members of the cast, you know, the, 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 the lesser members of the cast, who didn't really cause great problems, but would sort of come into my office every week terribly upset and say, you know, uh, I had four, four lines in the last episode and I've only got three lines in this episode. <laughs> what did I do wrong? But I mean, we, we, we really didn't have um, uh, too much trouble other than that. Um, my main problem was with um, Robert Vaughan uh, when I made The Protectors. And, uh, you know, since I since I don't want to uh, get myself sued, um, I'll just tell you one story, and then if you multiply it by 100, you'll, <laughs> you'll get some idea of what we had to put up with. Um, but we were um, in preparation for the protectors. Uh, we were working at uh, Associated British Studios in Elstree, and we were waiting for Robert Vaughan to arrive from Los Angeles to start filming and I was sitting at my desk and suddenly the door was kicked open in my office and standing in the door was a cowboy you know the, the hat the, the, even the spurs the boot the whole lot and he said are you Jerry Anderson and I said yes and he threw a script you know which circled through the air and landed beautifully on my desk wonderful shot <laughs> and I said oh, this is the first script he said yes and it's a load of crap. So I said, well, if, you know, if that's what you... I mean, first of all, who are you? And he said, I'm Robert Vaughan's partner. So I said, is that what he thinks about this script as well? He said, yes, he thinks the same. So I said, well, why did he sign for the series? And he said, baby, the money was good, and slammed the door. So <laughs> that gives you some idea of the sort of approach and uh, we, we had a very, very difficult time all the way through the series. Now, we'll have questions from the audience um, after the next question. Um, and, I mean, it, it's interesting you mentioned difficult shows in production, but, um, I mean, I've followed your career sort of ever since I can actually remember being a sentient life form, if you like. Um, there, there have been so... <laughs> what was that? Oh, thank you so much. Have a nice day. <laughs> I, I was told just there, if you didn't hear it, uh, I, 
last week was apparently uh, the time I became a sentient life form. If we can just um, uh, uh, plug in that gentleman's chair and switch it on, that would be very nice. Thank you. Um, yeah, there, there have been a lot of um, attempts by yourself to get shows into production which have, have actually not got there due to the lack of backing uh, and lack, lack of vision and imagination from the people who, who finance the shows. Is, is there one particular one of those that went into production hell which you really, really wished had actually made it to the screen? Um, not really. Uh, I suppose, uh, well, come to think of it, I suppose, yes. I suppose um, there were two things I wish had made, made it. One was called Five Star Five, which was intended to be a very, very big um, science fiction movie. Uh, at the time it was budgeted for 11 million dollars, but I mean it was a long time ago, so we're probably talking, you know, 70 or 80 million dollars in today's money. And this one was to be financed by um, a bunch of people who were uh, in the oil business. And you know, everything went well until the first tranche of money was due and then uh, then it didn't happen. And uh, <coughs> the, way the, the, the way the picture collapsed was that we put pressure on these financiers, um, you know, saying that we, we, we were now commencing the production and we needed funding. And one of their partners was in uh, Bank Lume in Israel doing business and he obviously got our message to say that we urgently developed money, uh, d d required money and he uh, he very cleverly came out of the manager's office and on his way out of the bank, I mean we learned this afterwards he waited outside the telex room and when the girl came out to go to lunch. He said, oh, he said, excuse me, can I send a very, very long telex to Pinewood Studios in England? And she said, well, well, I'm going off to lunch. Uh, is it urgent? He said, well, it is really. And she said, well, there's a machine. You can use it if you like. And so, of course, he went in and sent a telex, uh, which came through to me as if it was from the bank. And it said, the money's on its way, you see. And we, we wanted to check this, so we, uh, we telexed uh, Bank Lume, you know, we, which was their answer back number on the, on the telex, and, and simply said, are you Bank Lume? And back came the answer, yes we are. And we thought, right, we're in. And on the basis of that, we booked the 007 stage at Pinewood and made a lot of other commitments. But of course, the money didn't turn up. Uh, we found out about this uh, fraudulent telex and uh, the, the bunch of investors vanished into thin air and I haven't seen them to this day. <laughs> so that was one picture I would have liked to have made. And the other one was um, many years ago, Cubby Broccoli, uh, Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, the two people who produced the Bond pictures. And Harry Saltzman called me to his office one day and said, I want you to produce uh, the next Bond picture, which was um, Moonraker. And I, of course, I was delighted. And uh, I took away the book with me that he gave me. And I got together with uh, Tony Barwick, who's written many of my episodes. Tony sadly died a couple of years ago. But uh, Tony and I together wrote a 70-page treatment and I took this around to Harry Saltzman's house and uh, by the time I got home he was on the phone to say I've read the treatment, it's absolutely fantastic I thought well that's great and then uh, I was about to go to bed and um, I, I got another call to say um, Jerry, just, you know he said I, I've just read it again just to make sure I wasn't wrong and he said is there's no, no question about it, it's absolutely sensational, we're going to make this picture. And then at 8 o'clock the next morning the telephone rang and it was him again to say, I've just woken up, 
you know, fresh mind, I thought I'd read it for a third time. And he said, I have no doubt about it, you know, this is one of the best treatments I've ever received for a Bond picture. So we're going to make it. Well, of course, you know, you can imagine, I, I felt great about that. But then nothing happened for a while, and then I heard that um, Harry Saltzman was selling out to Cubby Broccoli, which he did. And, of course, uh, that opportunity passed me by. So, you know, there, there are two pictures I would have liked to have made. That was, comes as news to me about the Bond film. That, that's, mm. that's incredible. It's in the book, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, like a lot of people, am sort of surprised that uh, kids of today watch these programs and uh, enjoy them. Um, you know, people say to me sometimes, well, why was such and such a program a success? And uh, I guess every, every producer in the world would like to know why some pictures were a success, because, it, you know, if, if one only knew that, one could then have one success after another. And not only that, you could sell the secret to other producers, and, you know, be, be worth a fortune. It, it's not possible to, to say why these things are successful. Um, all I can tell you is that... Uh, Many years ago, when I worked in a film cutting room, I worked with uh, Lewis Milestone. And I'm sure none of you here would know him, but he was the director who filmed All Quiet on the Western Front, which, which is one of the most famous films in cinema history. And he, he said one day, he said, um, he said, I'm gonna give you some advice, Jerry. Never try to guess what your audience is going to like because you'll never succeed. You just do what you want and what you what you think is good, and if people like it as well, then you're damn lucky and you're successful. Well, that's what I've always done. I just simply do what appeals to me, and uh, it seems that I have the mind of a ten-year-old child of today. Well, I'm with you on that definitely. Uh, another question: Where's Martin gone? There he is. Oh, no, that's not it, Martin. Over here? Oh, we're over there. Um, I'd like to ask how the second series of UFO developed into Space 1999, and also, on a slightly different question, what you would have done differently with Moonraker to the film that actually emerged? He's got two questions in there. Goodness me. Well, let's get rid of the Moonraker one first. I didn't see Moonraker, so... Strike one? But I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't answer that one. Um... I, I didn't quite catch all the question. Were you asking, you know, whether it was true that this, that the second series of UFO turned into Space 1999? Uh, I yeah, think that's yeah, really. the, the general evolution of it from, um, because there was a second series of UFO on the cards, wasn't there? And then well, everything seemed to go, um, well, up in the air. Yeah, I, what happened, in fact, was um, I was uh, filming the protectors and I was in uh, Austria filming when I heard that UFO, which was syndicated in, in the United States, meaning that it was sold station by station, was leading the ratings in New York and Los Angeles and had been number one for 17 consecutive weeks. And uh, that they were deciding to uh, you know, whether to make a new series. Well, the fact is that they did decide to make a new series, and we started to prepare for the second season of UFO. We um, designed a very much bigger moon base on the basis that, you know, time had moved on and, you know, it was going to be much bigger. And we had started to um, work out some storylines, and we're generally working on the format when the ratings in America, for some reason or other, started to dip. And the American office in New, New York, who really were the biggest problem in our lives over here, uh, panicked and said, um, you know, stop the new show because the ratings are falling. I don't suppose for a moment they, just, they, they tried to work out why the ratings were falling. You know, it may have been that there was just a a hugely successful show in opposition 
or maybe it was a changing of the season, or maybe there'd been a political event. But anyway, they didn't check on any of that. They just panicked and said, stop. Um, we had spent quite a lot of money and quite a lot of effort on this uh, new show of UFO. And so I went along to see Lou Grade, who backed all the shows, and I said, look, um, it seems a pity to waste all this money and effort. With a, with a little bit of a twist, you know, we can... Um, turn it into a new show. And he said, well, that's a great idea. So uh, let's, let's do that. Now, the interesting thing there was that um, when I phoned America to tell the New York office that we were going to turn it into a new show, um, the president said to me, uh, where will the action take place? And I said, well, you know, we, we haven't kind of invented the show yet, but, uh, but most of it will take place in space, but some of it will take place here on Earth. And there was a dull thud, and he said, listen, Jerry, I want every single story to take place in space. In fact, I want you to give me a format which makes it impossible for any story to take place on Earth. Because if it does, it, but it, because it, if you have a format that, that makes it possible for a story to take place on Earth, I'll stop the show. And so what did we do? We blasted the moon out of Earth orbit and phoned him and said, here's what we're going to do. And now you can never have a story on, <laughs> on Earth. And he said, OK, go ahead. So that's how Space 1999 came about. I mean, th th I've heard people relate that story, but it was sort of like, a, a little bit more brusque on your part, but you've gone, you want me to do what? I Okay, I'll blow the moon out of orbit. So it wasn't quite that sort of an instant reaction. No, no. No, no I mean, you know, these things, uh, even if you're a quick thinker, they take a little while to think out. But uh, that, in fact, is, is how the, the, the premise came about. Okay. Do we have another question? Martin's around with the mic. Where are Zoom you, Martin? Hi. Where okay. are you? That way. Okay. Oh, he's in the middle. Will you have any creative control over the Thunderbirds movie, or is it all down to Polygram? Okay, well, I've been asked this question all week, on every interview, on every broadcast. I mean, yesterday I did uh, 14 broadcasts, and that question came up every time. Now, the reason I, the reason I tell you this is because there's no doubt about it that there is a tremendous interest in a Thunderbird feature film. And the situation is as follows. The rights to Thunderbirds belong to Polygram. And Polygram Filmed Entertainment is the division that makes the movies. And they are based in America, in Los Angeles. Now, about a year ago, I was invited to go to America to see them. And I went there and they said, we want to make a film, a movie of Thunderbirds. We want to make one of Joe 90 and we want to make one of Captain Scarlet. Well, you know, that was very exciting. We had a few discussions on Thunderbirds. I mean, hardly in intense, but you know, there were some discussions. And I said, look, before we go any further, I, I really want to get this clear. Um, it, it, what will my position be if you make Thunderbirds? And they said, well, I mean, you know, you're the guy who invented it. I mean, you, you produce it, obviously. So you can imagine I felt pretty good about this. Then uh, I said my goodbyes, and uh, one of the producers over there that I talked to said, uh, Jerry, I'm, I'm coming to London on Tuesday. I'll, I'll see you. I'll see you then. I said, OK, fine. I'll see you on Tuesday. And I came back to London. I haven't heard from Polygram to this day. You know, this is probably now 14 months ago. Um, they own the rights, and therefore they don't have to speak to me. But I would have thought any person with any common decency uh, would want to keep in touch, maintain a friendship, you know, 
but nothing. Um, I don't think very much of them for that. And I've got to the point now where I'm not too sure that I would want to work with them anyway. Uh, they, they had talked about um, making a live action film uh, because, quote, they had to um, do well in the American market. Well, Thunderbirds isn't all that well known in America, so that seems rather odd to me. They talked about um, making an animated version, that is to say, with very sophisticated puppets. And I think with modern technology, that could be quite sensational. And it could also mean that the characters would appear exactly as they were in the original shows. Um, but then they, they decided that was going to be far too expensive. I suggested that we could make it here in this country where we, we, where we would get much better value and was immediately shouted down, you know, by saying, uh, people saying, oh, no, no, we can produce it for the same price here in America, which, of course, is nonsense. So, you know, frankly, I'm not very happy with the situation. Um, I've already told you I'm in production. I'm in production with British finance, with a British company, living at home. And, uh, you know, I don't really care anymore about what Polygram do or don't do. But in answer to your question, I don't know any more about it than you do. I'm afraid. OK, we've got time for about two more questions. Martin, are you lined up with the next one? I Where am. are you? What are the chances of there being another Space Precinct series? Sorry? What are the chances of another Space Precinct series? Um, I, I'm not sure that there will be any more Space Precincts, certainly in the immediate future. Um, Space Precinct was uh, financed by a small American production company and uh, they were very, very keen on the idea and very supportive. But unfortunately, when we got to episode 18, um, the company went bankrupt. Not our company, but the American company. We managed to get enough money to complete the series, but um, in their sort of desperation to raise money, they sold Space Precinct into the American market on literally any slot they could get. Two o'clock in the morning, you know, anything. Consequently, uh, the American distribution was messed up, and for the moment, there's no plans for a new show. But, uh, you know, surprising things happen in this business, and I'm hoping that it will eventually um, carry on. OK. Uh, now, one final question. One final question, Martin. What have we got? I hope it's a good one. Hello? Are you still in touch with any of the characters from UFO? You mean the uh, artists? Yes. I, I see uh, Head Bishop um, fairly regularly. Um, usually when we're doing uh, interviews about UFO, <laughs> oddly enough. <laughs> um, you know, I've already said that, that I've got the highest regard for Ed. He hasn't changed as a person. He's, uh, he's still got what he describes as a wall-to-wall -wall corporate voice. Um, any, any of you who've heard him speak know that he's a you know, very intelligent guy. And um, I love him. So yes, I still see Ed. Um, at conventions, I see Dolores Montes and her husband. Um, I haven't seen Mike Billington, says he with some relief. Cue for laughter. <laughs> Is there something we should know there or, or not? Is he here? No. <laughs> Ah, oh, well then. <laughs> we get the dirt at last? <laughs> no, he was, he was a good-looking guy and he was a good actor, but um, he was no Ed Bishop. And he made life a little difficult in as much as, you know, Ed had this uh, wonderful quality 
of not being concerned like 25 hours a day how he looked, right? He was not a mirror gazer. And that, I suppose, tells you all you need to know about Mike Billington. <laughs> but um, Keith, uh, I can't remember his name now. Keith Alexander? Keith Alexander, I've seen here and there. Um, but other than that, no, I, I haven't seen any of the old cast. Right. We have one final surprise, which again is related to the awards. Is the cheque made out to me or my company? <laughs> <laughs> we have a category in our Hall of Fame, which we uh, extend every year, and it's for producer. And your name was nominated along with Rick Berman from Star Trek, Brian Clemens, Philip Hinchcliffe, and J. Michael Strzinski of Babylon 5. And these people out here, with their voting forms, decided that you should be the 1996 uh, entrant into the Hall of Fame producer. Oh. And here's the award. <laughs> we have Sarah, once again. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I, th I think I'll stay a bit longer because that's, that glass door, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be able to hug glaze all the panels. Well, yeah. we're trying for you. We're trying for you. Yeah, well, you know, once again, that's uh, wonderful. Um, I suppose uh, particularly um, up against those uh, glittering names that were in opposition. So it's made my day, folks. Thank you. Now, I, I wonder if you would all make Jerry's day in the next uh, uh, hour or so. Uh, Jerry is uh, going to uh, pop down to the Chaos Club um, in a few minutes' time. And this glorious specimen, the Jerry Anderson authorised biography, will be down there for you to uh, uh, buy your copies and get them signed personally by the man. So. Uh, I hope you will make your way down in a orderly fashion and um, we'll be with you shortly. But in the meantime, could you please show your appreciation for Jerry Anderson? Left my uh, washing bag in London, so I haven't shaved and I've just bought some Bic razors. So I've got that to look forward to, shaving with a bit. You know, I'll probably be blood everywhere. I'll probably be dead by lunchtime. Thank you very much. But I've bought them now, you know. Mind you, I could take them back and get my 49p pack back, couldn't I, really? Very kind people around. If you look hard. Yeah, Norman, welcome to Thank Caster, to Sunny yeah, Caster. Yeah, lovely, great. I really, you know, it's great walking through mud <laughs> and living in a little cardboard box, you know. There's no one around selling the big issue, I noticed. <laughs> <you know. laughs> They'd get all wet and soggy, wouldn't they? <laughs> Nobody else. When I see big issue sellers, I walk along and I pull my, pull my pockets out of my trousers like that. Mm. Just walk <laughs> along. You don't have to say anything. Just go like that with your pocket and walk by. It. <laughs> There's a rude joke connected to that, isn't there? An elephant or something. Oh. Uh, I don't do rude humour. I just thought, you know, just... Uh, so I'm not going to go any further. Go on, over <laughs> Oh, look, there's me. <laughs> 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 Look at that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. I mean, it, it feels so rude, you know, really. But, but later on, you know, but the next time you see me, it'll all be clean and it'll be different. So you're seeing two sort of Norman Lovitz today. So what, what a bargain. <laughs> I'm still wet, you know. I'm still wet. Anyway, carry on. Carry on, Henry. Henry. <laughs> I could do this myself, really, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's be serious. 
Now, Norman... Exactly why. Yeah. <laughs> in this bloody weather. Christ. Yeah, see, it could be raining indoors, it could be worse, couldn't it? I mean, Christ. <laughs> Wouldn't that be the end if a cloud came in and it just rained, you know, bloody... <laughs> Off you go, Henry. <laughs> make up, make up. Come on. Okay. <laughs> no, you know, you've, done, you've done a few conventions. Have you ever done one like this before? It's just where it's not entirely devoted to Red Dwarf. Um, well, the one in Chicago was devoted to uh, Star Trek and Doctor Who and stuff like that, and Red Dwarf pinned in on the end, you know. Um, so, yes, I have done. Yeah, I have done them, yeah, yeah. How do you find the American ones compared to the English conventions? Well, I, I find that Americans are more open about what they say. I mean, they cut, they're more forward, aren't they? You know, um, the, uh, whereas uh, I've got to be careful what I say here. You know, the laughter could stop and the, <laughs> the love and adulation could just go away. <laughs> We're more reserved in this country. That's what I'm trying to say. More reserved about you know, coming forward to it. Whereas over there they talk to you like they've known you all their lives, you know. So I don't know what I prefer, really. I don't know. It just... Uh, but, they, they, I mean, I'm just surprised that Red Dwarf, you know, has a following over there, and it, it does. They, they, they like it. I just didn't think they'd get it at all, but they certainly do, you know. Not all of them, just the, the crazier ones, you know. Uh, yeah, the, off, the offbeat type, people who like their sort of different things, you know. Anyway, go on, I'm waffling now. Well, no, we, we all know you, you're a, uh, a stand-up comedian as well, and uh, you're doing your one-man show tonight for us. Uh, how did you get into the comedy? How did you start doing stand-up? Um, there was a friend of mine had a band, and uh, I went on at half-time. It was in Kings Road, Chelsea, a really pretty rough pub, and he had a band, and I went on at half-time and did this act, and I had a false nose. I had a centre parting <laughs> I had hair in other words and I, I was doing I don't know what I was doing really but it went down like a lead balloon I mean everyone was just talking loud and ignoring me but and the, in the audience though someone did like me uh, 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 the lead singer with a band called 999 who were a punk band and they took me out and I did a tour with them and, and I did pretty well and I did gigs with The Clash and Bauhaus and of course, after that, the comedy store came along and I was able to just do stand-up comedy, you know, with the likes of uh, Rick Mail and Alexi Sale. Used to be the comp pair, there used to be a gong. and You used to have to drink three pints of lager to get on stage. I tell you, it was frightening. It was... But that was the start, you know. That was the start of it, really. And you're saying you're still doing, you still do the gigs around the country and you're saying you, you, you still like to do university gigs and... Yeah, I've just done a load of university gigs. I did, did, did some in Wales and uh, I, I just think the longest I went without doing stand-up was about two years um, when I was doing my series, I think. And, and when you're doing TV, you can neglect it, but I, I vowed sort of not to leave a big gap between doing stand-up so you keep it going, you keep writing new material and keep your hand in as it were it is very important to do that I think so that's what I do now you know so how, how, who how did you get how did you land the role in Red Dwarf was did they approach you or did you have to audition does anyone remember a program called don't miss wax on channel 4 where I used to play the floor manager who interjects this wet soppy floor manager well I'd had that so I had a little bit of a cult I had a bit of fame there uh, from that. And then Red Dwarf came along, and originally I went up for the part of Rimmer, if you can believe that, um, with Peter Hugo Daly, uh, who's an actor, a very good actor. He was, he was Lister. We read for the part, and we obviously didn't get it. But the, later on, they, they said, would you like to do Holly the computer? Would you like to read for that? So I read that, and it was just a voiceover, and I thought, this is ridiculous, a voiceover on TV. And I've just had that bit of, you know thing with Ruby Wax so I just thought I want to be seen and I moaned because I can moan but it, you, I tell you <laughs> well you heard me earlier didn't you about the weather I'll be moaning all day today I tell you this, this rains but look can you believe it's supposed to rain all day I mean unbelievable <laughs> and there'll be a water supply shortage um, so 
yeah, I moaned and moaned. I said, look, I said, he can be seen. Holly can be seen. And, and I suggested this idea of cutting off the neck and just the face on the screen, middle of the screen. Uh, and they went for it, but uh, I had to really push for that. But it was worth it in the end because it was a, it was a good character to do, you know. I mean, basically, it's me, really. You know. And the writers just writing to, to order, really. Oh dear. Sorry, go on. Sorry. <laughs> now, you, you only did the two series, though, and then you just walked away from it. Always leave them wanting more. And, and they do, they do want more. No, I, I was more cherished by being in those two series than by being in the whole lot. I mean, the character's gone now. I mean, for God's sake. That's a bit upsetting when you see a character disappear. But um, I left. There was, a prob there was a problem. I'd moved to Edinburgh. I'd just met my wife and... Uh, I had Red Dwarf 3 to do and I was going to be away for a long time and I just suggested that Holly wasn't used on OB outside broadcasting because I just thought it's a waste of time, you know, Holly. All you do, when Holly's on outside broadcasting, I just sit in a truck and a cameraman's there, a bored cameraman, you know. And I'm in a truck on location. I said, what's the point of that? Why can't we just record it in the studio and play it in, you know? So they said, okay, we'll cut that out and... Uh, a day's rehearsal and then there was a thing about that my fee was halved you know and I said well that can't be right you can't do that surely we, we better talk about this and they wouldn't they thought I was being I don't know above myself or whatever and I said well I'm not having that and I stuck out and they stuck out and the producer of Red Dwarf at that time was a very tough man um, someone we, we all respect because he, if it wasn't for him there'd be no young ones there'd be no Red Dwarf you know, he, he, one of those producers that knocks down doors, you know, to get, get things put on and pushes and fights, and, and you've got to respect him for that. But at the same time, it, was a, it wasn't a very nice thing that happened. But, uh, you know, that's how it was. I, I suppose I can be quite stubborn as well, so. But in many ways, I don't mind now. It's history now. I mean, look, at so much has happened there since then with Craig... Charles with what happened to him and the writers have split up Rob and Doug you know it's just you know there's so many things seem to be happening you know but that's all resolved now and Red Dwarf 7 goes out in January and uh, I said I'd say this at the end Henry but I, uh, I'd say now that I'm in the last episode of uh, the new series of Red Dwarf so you can work that out for yourself really <laughs> Not letting any storylines go then? No, not at all. Not allowed to. I'll get <laughs> murdered, you know. It's a big secret, I mean, crikey. So it's only a television programme, isn't it? <laughs> Surely we've got better things to do, haven't we? Come on, let's do something else. Let's walk along the beach. <laughs> they found some am ammunition on the beach. That's right, yeah, yesterday, yeah. yeah. No jokes, no jokes. <laughs> just, a, just a bit of information. So, t do you find that the character of Holly, though, it's j since you've left it, it's sort of like dwindled and dwindled, and, and as you say... It's and like it turned into a woman. It turned into a woman. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, my own view on that was that they should have come in with another character instead of a character that was basically a female version of me, because I don't think it really worked. Um, I think that, that's what they were going to do. They promised me they'd do that. They said it would be replaced with another character, but in the end they, they just they kept it fairly much the same, really. And then it disappeared, yeah. I mean, because uh, they left Red Dwarf, didn't they? And, you know. But there you are, you know. So, I mean, you've got no regrets about your decision about the, the doing the two... Well, apart from the dosh. Dosh, yeah. <laughs> um, But I've never been a person... I've never been ruled by money, you know, I never have. I, I really... Terrible, really, because most people are, aren't they? Money's the whole thing, money's the god, really. But it never has been to me, never has. The, the, this hasn't. They do like the magazines and the, the comics that we're doing then. When do, do I get paid for this, by the way? <laughs> no, go on, go on. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry, <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible. It wasn't worth it, was it? <laughs> does this one work, work as well? Oh, it yeah. does, yeah. Carry on, go on. <laughs> this one's going out to America. It's on satellite, this one. So well, they, they've just picked us up now. Hello, America. Oh. Yeah, okay. Well, I won't tell you what I said earlier, but... Uh,
Goodbye, America. <laughs> Go. I suppose what happened is, when I was at school, at my secondary school, which was St. Bede's College in Manchester, um, when I was 11, all my mates decided they wanted to be in the annual school play, which we used to do at Gilbert and Sullivan every year. Now, it was a boys' school, and we played all the parts. So I suppose it's no stretch of imagination to realise that the 11 and 12-year-olds were going to play the girls' parts. Because uh, what first attracted to you to show Well, it was, <laughs> playing girls' parts. Um, <laughs> yes. You're a mucky lot, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, at the age of 12, I found myself playing Rose Maybud in Ruddy Gore. Rose Maybud is the soprano lead in Ruddy Gore. And uh, I got a review in my school magazine that said, Colin Baker, that's me, threw himself with great verve into the part of Rose Maybud and rarely strayed more than half an octave from the note. <laughs> now, at the time, I thought that was a really good review, you know. And I cut it out and I put it in my scrapbook. And it's only about 30 years later when I came back, I realised there was perhaps an implied criticism there about my singing ability. Um, so then what happened, I did those every year at school and, and enjoyed them. Because um, like you'll hear a lot of actors say, I was a shy, retiring lad. But suddenly, getting into women's clothes, or getting into somebody else's character indeed, and playing somebody else, it was a kind of, oh, this is something I can do. So I did that at school and then sort of felt it was something I quite liked to do. When I was 18, my father said, uh, well, what do you want to do with your life then? I said, well, what I want to do is go to a university somewhere and spend three years looning around, drinking a lot, and doing a bit of drama, which was perhaps a foolish thing to say to my father, because he said, no, you're not going to do that. You start in the solicitor's office on Monday. Um, he'd already sorted that out. So I was trotted off to a solicitor's office in Manchester, where I served my five years articles. And about two years in, I was with my mother watching... This is a very short question. You're getting a very long answer, aren't you? I'm no fool. I've got a sore throat. <laughs> I um, was sitting in the Palace Theatre in Manchester with my mother, watching the North Manchester Amateur Operatic and Dramatic Society's production of The King and I. And I said to my mother, Oh, I wish I was up on that stage. And the man sitting in front turned around and said, As it so happens, son, I am the chairman of the North Manchester Amateur Operatic and Dramatic Society, and we're crying out for young lads like you to come and join us. Turn up next Friday night at the Simpson Memorial Hall in Moston and give us an audition. Well, the audition was walking through the door, really. Uh, if you could walk through the door, you were in, especially if you were male, because they had about 365-year-old uh, women, two 30-year-old women, and about four 60-year-old men in the... North Manchester Amateur Operatic and Dramatic Society. So me and my mate, now this is a trivia question for you. On the same day, another lad joined who was local, and his name was Malcolm Roberts. Now those of you over the age of umpty nine might remember a singer called Malcolm Roberts, who briefly had a, he was a kind of sub-humperdink singer. Uh, last time I saw him, he was, he was singing a song for Monaco in the, um, in the Eurovision Song Contest. And Malcolm ha did have a number three record once, I can't remember what it was, back in the late 60s. And he won the South American Song Contest. And he was very big in South America. But he and I joined that amateur drama group on the same day, and we became kind of mates. And he went into the musical bit, and I went into the acting bit. And systematically, over the next 10 years, he nicked all my girlfriends. Uh, he, he waited until I'd done all the hard work and taken them out and you know, was just about to get the first snog, and he moved in and took him. Um, we a good friend, you know, <laughs> good friend. We haven't seen each other for a while. I wonder why. Frightened. So that's how the acting started, anyway. And then I did five years of law, and I hated it. And I thought, you only get one life, don't you? You only get one crack, do you? Only as far as I know, yes. Yeah. Because you, you're in charge of this session, so I, I'm going to look to you for these important pieces of information. I know everything. Right. And so I thought, why do something you don't want to do? So I threw caution to the winds and rushed off to the drama schools and auditioned. And I spent three years at Lambda and I became what I loosely term an actor. Um, I mean, looking back now, after quite a lot of experience, uh, did you actually learn anything at the Amateur Dramatic Society? No. Not a thing? <laughs> no, actually, I probably, that was a glib answer, which wasn't true. Well, I, I probably learned more in the Amateur Dramatic Society than I did in my three years at drama school afterwards, which is kind of heresy to say, really. Because um, 
in those few years, it's very difficult. Because I went to see an amateur drama production uh, a couple of weeks ago in my local village where I live in Buckinghamshire. And uh, they were doing Tom Stoppard on the Razzle. But I'll briefly tell you what it's about. It's, it's a kind of Viennese farce thing. The central character is this elderly grocer who could never finish his um, sentences, right? Uh, and could never think of the exact word. So, unfortunately, they cast to play this part a man who couldn't remember his um, lines. <laughs> <laughs> so, after the first five minutes when he'd been prompted four times, any possible humour out of this man who could not remember his la words had gone out the window and we were all sitting there with these awful knots in our stomach thinking oh god you know because <laughs> there wasn't a laugh to be had and i thought back to my days as an amateur drama actor i thought was it like that was it like that because when you're doing it you know you think you're the bee's knees and i honestly think it wasn't because i think um up in north because all this all my childhood was around rochdale manchester uh, up in north there's a stronger tradition of i mean there's a drama group in every street practically mm. and the one I was in was the creme de la creme the Rochdale I, I, I moved from the North Manchester to the Rochdale Amateur now what's it called the Rochdale Curtain Theatre and we did some really good plays um, yeah, Chips with Everything and uh, The Crucible stuff like that and I actually think they were quite good and there were one or two there who'd, who'd been pros and they kind of dipped in and out an actor who's now in Coronation Street who plays Fred Thing the Butcher he was a member at that time and uh, so was Alan Rothwell, who'd been in Coronation Street, and one or two other people. So it was, a, it was I suppose, semi-pro. Mm. So I did learn a lot from them. Um, whereas when I went to drama school, I found there were an awful lot of actors who hadn't made it in the business trying to teach other people. And there's this fashionable thing of you know, breaking, breaking them down. You know? So any confidence you had is kicked out the window. And I left after three years at Lambda with less confidence and I think probably less acting ability than what I went in with. And when I left, we were trooped in one by one to see the principal. And to me, he said, uh, well, you obviously enjoy acting. So perhaps when you're in your middle years, you might have some success. But have you thought of going into stage management? And I came out really pissed off, <laughs> which made me more determined. He said exactly the same, give or take a few syllables, to the bloke who went in after me, who was David Suchet. Now, you know, I, could, I can't look at myself objectively. I can look at David Suchet and see that he's a really very good actor who's just got some smashing reviews for um, the new play he's doing with Diana Regan at West End. So um, they don't know everything there. I, if I gave you the names of the blokes that the principal of the drama school said, you are going to be a great star, you'd go, who? Because mm. <laughs> they vanish without trace. I mean, it's always surprised me. I mean, I've, my personal feeling is that apart from certain uh, techniques, um, you either have it in you or you don't to be an actor. You can get the average man off the street um, if you say, well, don't do this and don't do that, he, he probably could give a performance if he could lose the um, self-conscious bit. Yeah. But, I mean, I've, I've, a friend of mine, friends of mine have been at drama school, and they say it's the most embarrassing thing. Suddenly they're told, oh, you're a three-year-old girl, and uh, you're in the park, and you, then you turn into a flower. And um, they couldn't understand why they had to do this crap. And I, I, I couldn't understand how my male may not help you. <laughs> I, I have very <coughs> excuse me, strong feelings about acting because every now and then you read in the papers actors who are talking about their craft and their suffering and uh, it's, it makes me want to throw up really. I, I am of the acting school that is, w I will bracket myself here for the sake of this argument with Olivier, Paul Scofield, people like that, who can walk on a stage and make an audience laugh, cry, scream, gibber, all within a few seconds and brilliantly and turn to the bloke in the wings while they're doing it and saying uh, could you go and get me a pint please that's what I call acting that's the craft it's not to do with the actor working out his own neuroses it's to do with conveying something to an audience and when I read as I have in the past I, I mean uh, bless his heart I'm sure Ben Kingsley is a wonderful actor um, but when I read an interview with him when he was doing Silas Marner in the Radio Times and it said uh, you're filming in Wales, Ben, how do you, are you enjoying it? And he said, well, it's very difficult, I can't enjoy it because the character I'm playing cannot relate to the countryside around him. Therefore, I can't allow myself the luxury of enjoying what I'm sure is the wonderful Welsh scenery. What? <laughs> you mean, when the cameras say stop and he goes back to his bedroom and pulls the curtains in case he sees the nice Welsh scenery 
And you might think, oh, that's nice. Oh, bugger it, I've ruined my character. <laughs> I mean, that's what the implication is. And that is nothing to do with acting. Another example, Daniel Day-Lewis, another wonderful actor. Um, a friend of mine was doing a play in Dublin. Um, Daniel Day-Lewis wrote him a note saying, I'm, I'm going to come and see you tonight. See you in the bar afterwards. And he came into the bar afterwards. And it was a time when Daniel Day-Lewis was filming My Left Foot. And in the corner of the bar was Daniel Day-Lewis, like that. He'd come in character. And my friend uttered two very short words and turned around and left. Um, Go forth and multiply. Or that's the like one. Because that. if you wanted, if you have to do that in order to play a part, I, I think like all solitary vices, it should be kept to the privacy of your own room. And, well, and, on, and actors who sob in curtain calls because they've been through an emotional experience, you know, and people are clapping and they go, "Oh, thank you, thank you," you know, the pain, the suffering. Now, I like the one who goes, "Thanks, very nice. Uh, see you in the pub." Uh, oh, it was, it was Barry, <coughs> Barry Norman's father, Les Norman, <coughs> who was a very good director, actually. <coughs> but he used to shout a lot. And he just expected everybody to jump when he shouted. And um, this particular time, he started shouting. And I went... And he went... And I went... And he sort of came closer. And I sort of got him to disappear behind this sort of flat, a screen. And I said, don't shout at me. And he said, what? And I said, don't shout at me. I just don't react well to being shouted at. And if I said, I know you want to get home. At the end of the day, you want to get this shot in. And you're not going to be able to do it because I just don't react well to being shouted at. And I know that it'll, be, it'll all cost everybody money. At the end of the day, you're going to call the extra quarter. And he went, oh, right then. <laughs> well, we'll start again then. And he actually was sweet because not many directors, you know, exactly, because he was a sweet man. But it's just that he loved to shout at people. And so that was the only time I ever sort of had a sort of contretemps, but it, we became great friends afterwards. Carol, um... Directors, the Monty Python, the, the guy who did the first Ian show. Ian McNaughton. He, was it John Howard Davis who directed Well, the he first? directed, yes, he did. He you're did right, he, he did the first he, five. He yes, didn't want you Ian to McNaughton. do the, the series, he just wanted you to do one episode. Um, uh, it wasn't, no, no, that was, that was Ian who actually had in mind. John was fine. He was the producer, director of the show, and he directed the first, but he was mainly the producer. But it was Ian McNaughton who, and it wasn't, he didn't like me or anything like that. It's just that he had other lady friends, I think, that he wanted to include in the show. So he had sort of various ladies were going to get little appearances here and there. And uh, the fellas decided they, they wanted me. They wanted me there. So there was a bit of a disagreement about that. But the fellas put their foot down, their corporate foot, and said, no, we want Carol. And so occasionally other ladies appeared and did little bits. And they were his friends. 